Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining our panel discussion today to discuss UNC Health and how they transform their approach to clinical imaging. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please enter them into the chat, and we will get to all of them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. I'll pass it over to Ted now to introduce our panelists. Today, we're very lucky to have Jeff Agricola from UNC, Bradley Cook or Brad Cook from UNC Healthcare, and Dr. Cheryl uh, Petersoch from the Davos Advisors. Uh, I'm Ted Standen. I'm an Enterprise Imaging, Solution, Enterprise Imaging Solutions Specialist here to moderate uh, the panel and the forum. Today's forum is really to go over PACS consolidation. And, and many organizations find themselves today the owners of multiple PACs. And this is through merger acquisition. It can be done organically. Sometimes people come in and they don't know how they got so many PACs. And they're all departmental. Um, so when you have these departmental and multiple PAC systems, it means complexity. It means multiple technologies. It means expense. It means care and feeding. Um, sometimes it's just plain unsustainable. There's protected health information all over the place. And organizations say to themselves, this is insane. We need to stop this. And how do we do that? We need an enterprise imaging strategy. Um, and then the, the result of uh, what we're all experiencing today through mergers and acquisitions um, is the necessity of migrations from one system to another system. Um, and the migrations can be very arduous, they can be very expensive, uh, resource intensive. So when you, when you deploy an enterprise imaging strategy leveraging a DNA, um, we really believe it's probably the last migration you'll have to do. So when you consolidate into a multiple, uh, from a multiple into an enterprise imaging solution, you can reduce the complexity, you can save uh, operational and CapEx resources, um, you can save time, and you can have efficiencies in the systems that you support. It's all about really empowering your organization to make the right choices today that help you tomorrow. It's really about eliminating a vendor lock and block, having them dictate to you what you need to do instead of you telling your your partner vendor what you want to do. So members of our panel have been through this process or have worked uh, in an organization that have done this, and we'll be hearing from them on their experience and the results they've achieved. What pain points do you generally see with organizations that seek your advice um, when consolidating multiple packs within the single packs um, or surviving packs, I'll call it, because you can't always get rid of all of them? and doing it with a VNA, um, and, and what typically tends to lead them to a VNA solution? The first thing is, um, we always talk about a compelling event. So the first thing is, there's something changing in the organization. I see, I haven't yet seen an organization that's just embarked upon a new PAX contract that's now looking um, at a VNA. Usually they're at, at a transition point. Their radiology PAX contract is, uh, needs to be renewed, or their cardiology PAX needs to be review, renewed, or um, they, they know they need to get their arms around point of care ultrasound and they don't know where to begin. And I think, you know, we've been preaching about enterprise imaging for a long time. And I think especially in the radiology and cardiology world, as they approach their vendors and start to talk about replacement, I think most of the vendors are saying, hey, let's consider a VNA. Let's move beyond the PACs. And, you know, one thing I'd like to throw out today, and I'd love to hear what the other panelists think, um, I think we need to um, reconfigure how we think about the word PACs today, because in my, in my mind, in an enterprise imaging world, PACs is really just a diagnostic viewer and the cash that goes along with feeding it, and the, the long-term archive is decoupled. And so now you have this, you know, potentially the central VNA and all these different imaging management systems or diagnostic viewers feeding into it. So I guess um, that's how I'm going to use the word PACs in the enterprise imaging world. Um, so, you know, that's generally what gets them starting to think about a VNA. 
Um, in many of the organizations I work with, there are multiple different hospital systems. They may have different radiology reading groups. Oftentimes those groups have their own PACs, their own um, diagnostic systems. But the organization is re realizing that one, it may need to um, take advantage of subspecialty radiology care. So it might want to move images from a community reading group to a subspecialty academic center. And that's really hard to do if you have all these different siloed systems. Um, you know, one of the new ways I'm thinking about enterprise imaging is it's patient centric. It is no longer department centric or even hospital centric. We want to start developing that patient centric view. And if we think about what we've done with the EMR, we've taken the ED packs and the, I mean, ED um, EMR and the cardiology EMR and um, the oncology EMR, and we've merged them into a single centric system that manages the subspecialty workflows, but all in one location. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with enterprise imaging. And so when organizations start to think that way, they realize that they need to manage their images in, in a new architecture and in a new way. And that's when they really see the value of moving to the VNA. Um, lastly, I'll talk just about even in the radiology world, even if you have multiple different reading groups, and I know UNC, I think, is in this um, system, you still want them to have access to the whole view of the patient. So if the images were obtained at hospital A and the patient's following up at hospital B, for the, the most complete patient record, the most complete report, you wanna see those images from hospital A when you're at hospital B. And you can't do that if you have separate packs I mean, you can with an enterprise imaging exchange program, but it's a whole lot simpler and automated if you're all pulling from the same archive. Yeah, and I'll just add to that to what Cheryl was saying. So, you know, the, the, the driver is not only just continuity of care, but as we're moving towards population health-based models and at-risk payer contracts where you're, you know, you know Payments are tied to outcomes um, instead of the services provided. You, know, you can't really operate in a silo you know, anymore. So you have to have that longitudinal patient view to enable the continuity of care. And, and that's what we found as part of our journey. We start out with one hospital with you know, about 300,000 images you know, or studies done a year. We're now up to an integrated health delivery network, as Brad mentioned, of 10 hospitals doing almost 2 million studies a year. So to, to be able to provide the services you're expected to do to integrate the delivery network, you, you have to have you know, that, that, you know, that view across the patient's record and, and align and simplify you know, your PAC systems and your imaging services. Fantastic, thank you all very much. Um, and that may segue into, into Jeff, the, the next topic about UNC's decision uh, to consolidate multiple packs with the vendor neutral archive, um, and in your case, um, Mill Reed. Uh, what, again, to Cheryl's point, was the compelling reason or event that drove you to that decision? Because it's a big decision. You don't make that decision lightly. Um, and then who was, who was advocating for it? Was it uh, IT because having so many systems was just unwieldy and unsupportable? Was it a clinical initiative, um, as Cheryl and you mentioned, to see the whole patient? Um, or were there multiple departments involved? If you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, and, and governance is key. So it's important that you include a wide net of stakeholders. So it just isn't an IT project. It's, a, it's actually an enterprise initiative. We were really driven by the pressures around the, around the marketplace and, and moving 
to becoming an integrated delivery network and, and how patients move and transfer across the system to have what we call a vision of one. So originally that started out, as Cheryl said, with you know, combining you know, all the disparate EMR applications and you know, we have uh, you own know, an Epic shop, so we have one Epic at UNC. Um, we call Epic at UNC, but we have one Epic system across our organization. So, you know, and, and so we have one, what we call one patient ID, one problem list, one med list, one patient bill, so complete continuity of care of the medical record. But what we were missing was um, in that one patient, one chart was you know, one clinical enterprise imaging or one longitudinal view of the patient imaging record via a, a common viewer or something that's, a, that's the same experience for the clinician where you know, when they're viewing the images, they're not going to multiple viewers. And that's a cost savings as well, but it's also, you know, makes the, you know, the, the care delivered by the clinician much easier when they are able to, you know, utilize the same systems, you know, routinely and not having to go into different applications. Um, what we found when we were, we were moving towards the, the one enterprise imaging initiative is that, you know, we had a lot of infrastructure complexity. Um, we, you know, we wanted to make sure we had control from a business continuity and disaster um, recovery per, you know, concepts and pers you know, perspective and make sure that you know, we are um, planning you know, for you know, providing um, uptime um, across the organization. We had a number of standalone point of care devices with no imaging retention, which I think we'll touch uh, you know, on later that you know, were, were never viewable um, to anyone that, that now are, you know, seamlessly available in the longitudinal imaging record. Um, we really didn't have a good imaging um, life cycle management policy for a number of these um, electronically stored images, um, which, you know, I think Cheryl mentioned there's a little bit of debate now about that. You know, people were purging film routinely but not purging anything out of the packs. But now with, you know, um, AI and, you know, the fact that these become assets, do you really want to start purging them or not? So that's, that's becoming a little bit of a conversation, you know, among all organizations and in the industry. And then, as we mentioned, we had silos of data, so we want to, you know, eliminate those and have, you know, enable the continuity of care in the longitudinal, longitudinal patient view. Um, so where we wanted to go was, you know, improved access to images across the enterprise, um, compliant and secure data sharing. Um, we want to have reduced management complexity. Um, have sophisticated, you know, image lifecycle management policies, um, lower total cost of ownership. You know, when we have, you know, one system, it's, you know, there's many efficiencies that you gain. Um, and then take control back of our data. You know, you know when you're um, working with various PAX vendors, I think we've all experienced the fact, you know, that you get in the vendor lock, as Ted had mentioned, if their systems are very proprietary. And when you move to a, a VNA, um, which is truly neutral, which we were looking for, you know, a, a company that had open standards and allow us to take control back to our data, you're, you're no longer subject or held hostage to any particular company. So you have the ability to be flexible and switch to the, you know, um, best of breed solution, um, it, you know, very, very easily. Um, so th th those are some of the drivers in, in sort of our story of, of, you know, why we made these decisions. Um, and um, how we you know, how we consolidate it, and um, you know that that it is an enterprise-wide initiative. It's not an IT-driven um, you know project. Great, thank you, um, Brad. I've caught you kind of grouped here with with Jeff. Yeah, but what I think is really um, an important footnote to everything that Jeff said here is when you, especially with the Highland VNA, when you decide to consolidate with the VNA. You're really getting yourself, and I like to do this analogy, an uh, integration engine. You're really getting yourself the opportunity to do a lot of creative things with your imaging and how you route the data. You can put a VNA in front of a PAX or behind a PAX or both. <laughs> and um, you can do things like morph data if you're having complexities with certain types of modalities or manufacturers. Um, you are getting restful services with uh, uh, Wado RS and, and all sorts of those types of fancy new functionality. You're getting fire with nil endpoints. Um, you're getting all sorts of functionality and flexibility, just like an integration engine. So when you're talking about having to be able to accommodate all these different packs out there and the various issues and the headaches that you come up with, 
a VNA has been extraordinarily valuable, just like an integration engine, to be able to manage those data. And especially in situations like Jeff mentioned, where you have access to your data in the event of a uh, uh, you know divestiture or something, where you need to do your own migration out of your VNA or out of a PAX. Um, when you need to get that data out and, and have access to that yourself and be able to manage that yourself, it's very powerful and it's very important to understand that you will get that functionality with that type of DNA that Highland offers. So I just wanted to put that analogy in there as a footnote because you're not just getting an archive, a place to dump all your images. Even though it's very, very powerful and useful for that, you can, you know, segregate your images and .com databases and, and create sort of your own kind of tier and model and hierarchy for how those are stored. But to know that you can really do a lot of routing and manipulation on the data um, and, and pushing that data in different spots is really something that I would like to just share of how powerful a VNA can be for you. I think the um, organization of imaging informatics in a department really plays a role in how um, rapidly you can move to EI and how easily you can move to EI. You know, in many organizations, each department, especially large ones, each department maintains their own imaging informatics team and has a lot of ownership and a lot of time invested and can develop solutions that are 100%, meet 100% of their needs. Um, those organizations have a, a, a bigger hurdle to overcome as you try to move towards enterprise imaging. Um, <clears throat> you have to have an enterprise overview as opposed to a very department specific overview. And it can be perceived as a loss of power and a loss of control. And I think that is one of the barriers that some organizations have when they move to enterprise imaging. I think the organizations where the imaging informatics is more centralized it, are, are a little further up that hill. So they don't have quite as large a barrier to overcome as they try to move to enterprise imaging. And I think the key no matter where you are in that spectrum is making sure each imaging department has a point of contact and somebody who considers them their top customer and really make sure that they meet the needs of each department. And for departments like radiology that their life's blood comes from imaging, you know, it, 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 to have anything less than what they have today is not going to be well accepted. So, you know, the, the question really is, what do you recommend to organizations that are trying to decide whether to replace or consolidate, uh, leverage a VNA and move to enterprise imaging? And, it's important to note, I think, that we have the spectrum of scale. We have sites that are doing 35,000 annual radiology studies, and we have sites that are doing six and a half million. So I think there's some core um, recommendations or observations. Um, and do you have anything to add to that as to um, things they should consider in looking at a VNA or, or a viewer or an enterprise strategy? So, you know, clearly the organization of your imaging informatics is, is a point actually that I hadn't even considered when I was thinking about this question. But I think um, one of the biggest thing, and Jeff and Brad and Karen have all alluded to this, enterprise, you know, the move to enterprise imaging, the move to a VNA is not an IT project. It is a strategy. It is a long-term program it's going to take you three to five years or more to fully implement. So, um, you know, some organizations can become overwhelmed by the enormity of what enterprise imaging is. So first of all, it's, it's developing a strategy. You know, that's one of the things that um, Vidagos offers is helping an organization develop their strategy and their framework for 
what's important to them in their enterprise imaging program? Simple question. You're going to DICOM wrap everything. You're going to use DICOM and XDS. You're going to use DICOM and retain native formats. Just things like that. Big overviews that you can use. And then you have to develop that roadmap and, and look at everything that's going on in your organization, your dental systems um, out of life in two years. So, you know, you got to put a stake in the sand that, you know, you got to be prepared for that. So, you know, just, you can't eat the elephant whole. I've been told that over and over again. And you, you just have to take it one bite at a time. And, and I think that helps organizations from becoming overwhelmed. And you know what? You don't have to start with your DICOM studies. You know what? Maybe you're going to start with, you're going to pick your VNA and you're going to start with your POCUS, your point of care ultrasound, and you're going to get that under control because your radiology pack still has, you know, four more years left on its contract. So, so start with something outside of the traditional imaging and, and work your way into the more um, voluminous imaging department. So there's all different ways to go about it. So, you know, don't be overwhelmed by um, what you need to do. And know that you could use interim steps. I mean, we haven't talked about the ability to federate multiple archives, which is really a, a potential alternative to the VNA. Um, personally, I think it's really more of an interim strategy till you get to the VNA. You know, maybe you get, you have the VNA and you have your universal viewer. And right now all that's going into your VNA is your point of care ultrasound and some photographs. You can still create that entire um, patient centric view through a federated work list while you're waiting for your PACS contracts to expire or your migrations to be complete or we've talked about mergers and acquisitions um, to, to help you in that bridge as you take a new entity on board. So, um, you know, just, just, just know it's a long-term evolution and um, don't let that you overwhelm you. And again, my, my third point. So the first point was the imaging informatics and, and a thoughtful approach. Two, it's a long-term strategy. Three, other people have mentioned, get everybody on board from the beginning. Every imaging department needs to feel like they've had a voice. You know, if your radiology department's your compelling event, you still need to have cardiology or your surgeons on board as you pick your universal viewer. Um, which usually is the same one as your VNA. So bring everybody on board right from the beginning, even if they're not going to get the services for three years. That, that to me is a huge point. What benefits have you seen from your decision to move to a VNA, whether it was early or late stage, um, and start deploying enterprise imaging? And then do you feel that your organization is better for it? Um, it's hard sometimes to, to measure that, but you go back and you look and say, man, we're, we're more productive, we're more cost effective, um, we feel that we're innovative, we're representing well in the community, we're competitive. Brad, I'm going to put you first. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that um, uh, in regard to UNC? Oh, well, I'll try to... I'll try to play with Jeff a little bit. He'll stick to the operational. I'll get with the technical, and that way we'll kind of give you both the best of the breeds here. Uh, so in terms of our results and the decision, um, we've, we've actually had quite a bit of uh, benefits. For example, not, you know, we've, our soapbox speech is a patient of one or longitudinal record of, of one of consolidating and centralizing into a single repository to provide a longitudinal record across our healthcare system. So what that really means is we have a, a pretty iterative model for our enterprise imaging rollout strategy when it comes to imaging. It comes uh, specifically in value when we talk about migrating from legacy PACs onto a healthcare system PACs. 
uh, we have a very, uh, you know, standardized approach for migrating data from a legacy PACS into our VNA, uh, which comes with that, a MRN conversion that is now standardized. So when we work with other teams in terms of ISD or IT, we have a, a, a spec to work from, a standardized model for how we to perform MRN conversions, the formats in which we exchange those MRN formats with the various EHR legacy vendors when we do those extracts from those legacy systems. Um, we have seen migrations out of the VNA, which has been super valuable and, and very cost saving uh, uh, because we've been able to perform those migrations ourselves since that data is truly ne neutral and we have access to that data. So from a migration perspective, the results of moving to the VNA have been very valuable um, in terms of migrating in and even migrating out. Another thing that's been very valuable is really about providing that consolidated backbone. You talk, heard me talk about integration and interfaces. Um, we have seen the ability to integrate with many different systems. We've, we've integrated with all the ologies almost um, and on top of that, you, you, when you couple it with NIL, who, you know, directly accesses the VNA, uh, you don't have that overhead of DICOM when you work with NIL and VNA together. You give yourself a fallback solution to a lot of your diagnostic reading and viewing capabilities. Specifically, um, we've seen the VNA results be very popular with NIL in our orthopedic section of some of our entities where they will actually be reading directly out of NIL with their images and their modality sending directly to our VNA. <clears throat> so we've actually seen a strategy and a solution emerge where we have two streams of DICOM data that, data that we manage in our informatics and governance discussions. We have streams of data that go through a PACS and get archived to the VNA, and we have streams of data that come directly to the VNA. And um, like we've kind of heard with the point of care ultrasound explosion, even butterfly and portable ultrasound devices, uh, especially in this era of COVID, have been very, very um, interesting discussions to have because what we're seeing is a delineation in the ownership of those devices outside of <clears throat> informatics support groups, but with clinicians and specialty departments themselves. And so now we've evolved our VNA into being this mechanism for, um, you know, these mobile devices to, to start sending to. And it's really bred a lot of governance questions, a lot of operational questions, uh, but we know we have a really strong backbone because it's a consolidated space where all these things can be put and managed from a central location because when you, on top of the VNA, you also get a, an administrative tool called the Accio Admin Portal, and it allows all your informatics teams across the healthcare system to manage that VNA data um, pretty logically and seamlessly. So from a, from a technical perspective, that has been another big value of the VNA is having those point of care ultrasounds uh, come in. And another thing on top of, uh, I think the clinical aspects of the value of our VNA and some of the results were kind of unexpected is we have operational kind of value that we've kind of grown out of the VNA. For example, um, we have a QC archive that we've developed in our VNA. So in, for shielding our departments for CMS audits, we have the ability for them to send their phantoms and uh, you know, daily floods for NukeMed into a, a specific DICOM database so that all of our QC studies, especially ones that have had to be performed daily, are sitting there all together in a longitudinal timeline and they can click through their studies um, that they have QC from their modalities. So that's uh, another operational thing is um, just like with uh, 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 my chart, we do the secure links and you can share links now. Patients can share their links with physicians or friends and, and access those images from our central, you know, value of uh, our central repository of the VNA. Um, another operational thing is the uh, the, the sending to a CD burner and the downloading and burning of CDs. <laughs> so, I mean, it's uh, become this, you know, this animal that has grown beyond just clinicians and the clinical viewer. It's become this operational tool to have things in the VNA that can be searched and sent to um, a CD burner or searched 
and sent to PowerShare to share with other entities. As we've built workflows around our VNA now that you know has provided us some consistency across an ever-growing healthcare landscape, um, as well as as well as some operational efficiencies as we look to consolidate informatics workflow streams. Um, I don't want to talk too long. I know we're running short, but uh, in terms of some other results that I think the VNA has also uh, offered, and I want to get to this, is um, when you have a VNA and you've had some, you know, design discussions of how you want to orchestrate and organize your data, you also have the ability to some of these underlying EI kind of topics for long-term visions that you're preparing yourself nicely for. We talked about AI, and you have the ability with the VNA to um, you know, store structured reports in a separate archive, and you may want to have a natural language processor run over all those structured reports. Um, you may want to compress all your old data and store it in a lossy format for AI to run data sets over. Um, you may want to be aware that digital pathology is probably on the horizon, and having a VNA is going to provide you a very good position to start having a central location to start archiving. DICOM digital pathology SOP classes, um, and you'll have that infrastructure already in place with a VNA um, that you've matured and, and grown. You know, there are a lot, a lot of flexibility, a lot of tools, but at the end of the day, what it means is we're able to raise the standard of care, which is what's important, you know, for the patients, and, and we're able to provide services and a lot of our other partner hospitals that they weren't able to do before um, in a very efficient uh, manner. Um, in a very cost-effective way, which is what you know, we're all trying to achieve nationally within healthcare. Um, and then the other item that I found that was surprising, you know, we had a, governance is important, but you find that you become more innovative because you bring so many people to the table, and they're all now collaborating and working together so that, you know, and, and, and it creates synergies that you wouldn't expect. And that, that's been something that's been very special, I found, as we've moved along our enterprise imaging journey. And which also helps raise the standard of care. That's great. And I, you know, what I'm, what I'm sort of hearing is the likelihood of being able to arrive at yes um, is increased when you have options and technology to support, you know, your enterprise. Um, where previously it might have been no, we can't do that. You know, it doesn't work that way. So it's about options going forward. Well, there's a lot of discussion around the benefits of moving to enterprise imaging in a, in a VNA, yet many organizations like the sound of it, but they're not doing it. Um, and and uh, we and, and our uh, attendees may be curious as to why that is the case. And then what is a differentiator for the organizations that pull the trigger, that make that progressive move um, and, and actually acquire a VNA? or an enterprise imaging strategy? So <clears throat> I kind of want to use this transition to add some comments to the previous discussion about the experience at UNC. And my plea to all organizations that have had you know, success on their enterprise imaging journey is to try and quantify it and to publish it. Um, because there's very little hard data to bring to your CFO when you're trying to build the business case for why you need to do this. Um, it, it, we all know it in our hearts, what's the right thing to do, but when you have to build a business plan, you need to have good hard data on the ROI. So, uh, I ask um, my fellow panelists and anyone that's in the audience to, that's had successes that they could write about to please go ahead and do that. I only know of one article in the literature that really addresses some of the um, benefits that have been achieved through um, deploying an enterprise imaging strategy. And so, you know, that kind of moves me to one of the top reasons why I think many organizations aren't doing it. And because right now it's a really strong nice to have, and it's not a compelling need to have. And, and I've heard more than one CIO say, every year it's in the top 10 things I wanna do, but it's not in the top three. 
So there are a lot of competing priorities that always seem to leapfrog over developing an enterprise imaging strategy. But if you could show them that, you know, you're going to save uh, 30% of your storage costs by consolidating into a single archive and achieving those economies of scale. Now people are going to sit up in their chairs and, and take a look. Or, you know, through reduction in the number of licenses and maintenance and support and all of that, that you're going to achieve real dollar savings. Um, I think those are some of the reasons why some organizations don't move ahead. It's not, it's not that the CIOs or the chair of radiology or the COOs, you know, um, and we'll come back to that in a minute, don't see the inherent value, but it's being able to quantify the value to move it up the approval process that's really the biggest challenge for a lot of organization. And so, you know, that all boils down to the dollars. Um, and I think that's maybe one of the biggest reasons organizations don't do that is they're so um, capital constrained that um, if their PACS is working okay, you know, they just can't make that leap to, to go to a V&A. They just don't have that level of, we'll call it risk tolerance, or they're um, very, very far down the adoption curve, and they really want to see that more than 50% of organizations have converted to VNAs, and so now it's the time for them to do that. And we haven't crossed that point on the adoption curve yet. Um, and, and so I, I think part of what we need to be doing, part of what we're actually doing during this period of time is continue to educate people about all of the value that can be derived. I do see um, the size of the organization also can play a role. Um, <clears throat> so small, you know, very small organizations, and I know you talked about having some small organizations, they just don't see the reason to move and they feel that they can um, make their existing packs that's very vendor specific, but with a few additional tools, they can make that system work for their organization because really they have radiology and they may have a small cardiology complement that's already going into the packs. And most of their providers are private practitioners and they're not responsible for their photographs. So, you know, on the one end, you have those organizations that, you know, they can achieve the same output by not moving to a VNA. And then some organizations that have hundreds of hospitals and aren't going to see a lot of patient movement between those hospitals don't see the need for a patient centric system. And I think there's a sweet spot in the middle of um, larger single hospitals or uh, ver vertically integrated networks that really need this patient centric approach. And I see that that's the sweet spot that I, I see is moving more towards EI today. Um, and, you know, that's in the United States. You know, in Canada, it's a very different world where each of the provinces actually do have a single um, centralized image archive for the province. And then I believe all of those archives are networked together. So to some degree, what I'm speaking to is a byproduct of the US healthcare system and other countries are approaching this very differently than we are. <clears throat> so I think we need to keep that in mind. What other information would you have your, your panelists or attendees leave with about what your organization is doing around medical imaging? Yeah, what we did as far as ROI is um, we looked at 
you know, as we simplify our portfolio, the, you know, what would be the expected returns on investment and payback period. So I think um, Karen had mentioned, you know, you go through an RFI process and you, you start, you know, painting that picture of, of what, you know, the cost will be versus, you know, as you simplify the line, you gain economies of scale and you start, you know, providing that information to, you know, the stakeholders like the CFO and, and to your physician champions. And we're fortunate that, we, you know, we have a very um, involved and um, enthusiastic uh, CMIO. Um, and, you know, we, we took time to make sure that we educate, you know, around our enterprise imaging because many times a CMIO isn't someone from radiology, right? So we, we take time to include them and build a relationship and um, educate them about enterprise imaging and now they're, um, you know, they are probably one of the most informed members within our organization about enterprise imaging, and includes speaking on many panels nationally. I think the, um, the the important question for organizations to ask themselves is: Do they have a need to provide their patients with a longitudinal record? If you have multiple packs in your organizations, you have the ability to save costs consolidating that storage and provide a longitudinal view into your patient's imaging record. Um, you have the ability to show value with having a place to put all your images and migrate from legacy systems as you bring them on to maybe healthcare systems systems or doing portfolio simplification. Um, so I think the real benefits there is where you are seeing the opportunity to consolidate. A V&A is a really strong answer for that cost savings in any consolidation efforts you're doing. And then in terms of patient care uh, and patient satisfaction, you're having all those studies and images in a centralized location. And then look for workflows that could be streamlined. Um, maybe there's a big gap in your visible light workflow streams. You know, we have, um, you know, OR procedure areas that are taking videos and images. Uh, maybe you want those stored in a centralized location. So your CMS audits for, for uh, your point of care ultrasound, stuff that really maybe doesn't live in PACS today, but you want to find it a safe spot so that you're safe from a, um, a CMS audit. Those are all important driving factors, I think, around making decisions of, of why you need a V&A and the value that it can bring. Right, thank you. And Dr. Peter Schultz, um, you'll have the last word uh, on the forum. So are there any uh, closing thoughts that you'd like to present? Um, I think we've actually covered a lot of really important ground. And I think um, if we get our clinical colleagues, so I'm a radiologist by training, if we get our clinical cardiol uh, colleagues, our, our pulmonologists, our ED physicians, um, the end users to start asking for this service, it is they're a very strong voice. Um, and if you can have them behind you in supporting how this is going to impact the care of the patient, that is going to go a long way towards um, helping garner support for developing an enterprise imaging strategy and implementing things like the VNA. Thank you all. We appreciate everybody's participation. Terrific. Well, thank you to Brad, Jeff, and Cheryl for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. So attendees, please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard there. And we'll try and get through as many of these questions as we can today. So let's see, panelists, a few questions have come in in the meantime. Let's see, the first one here is regarding your standardized our MRN conversion when migrating data. Is this a manual process or more of an automated process? Can you speak more to that process and provide some further detail? Jeff, Brad, or Cheryl, can one of you take the first swing at this question and then I'll open it up to your co-panelists? Yeah, this is I'm Brad. Go ahead, sorry, Brad. Cheryl, did you want to go jump on that one? I'm sorry, we're talking about the MRN conversion question. 
My audio broke up a little bit. I apologize. Um, I said I was deferring to you. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, regarding an MRN conversion when migrating uh, DICOM data, there's, there's definitely some considerations and definitely some processes that you can um, undergo in terms of your planning for that migration. Uh, one of the first things that we always try to do is automate the process, especially with some larger migrations. For example, if you're doing a 4.5 million study migration, you definitely want to try to automate as much of that as possible with a high confidence rate of your matching. So traditionally what we do at UNC is we get an extract out of the historical EHR or PAC system where we're migrating the data from. And we do some analysis on that data because not only are there sometimes MRN conversions that you need to think about, but you also may need to think about your accession number uh, conversion as well with any migration. Uh, but specifically with the MRN conversions, what our process is that we automate is that we get an extract from the legacy EHR PAC system. We import that data um, into a database. We actually do a extract of our EHR and we just basically what we call bump it up against our EHR, which is we try to do the logical matching on the patients. Um, so when we do migrations, we have an HIM team that will be able to process and look at the identity concepts of each of the patient records and their identifiers and put together an export for us that we can then use uh, with high confidence ratings that we can automatically convert their MRM on the fly of the migration. So how that traditionally is done is we just basically import the extract into a database table with the old MRN and the new MRN. And as the DICOM studies are being ingested into our VNA, we do a lookup against that table. And that table then finds the old MRN and replaces it with the new MRN. Um, and then we store both of the MRNs in the DICOM header in our VNA. So we don't lose track of the old MRN. It's something that we write just in a, uh, a sequence of DICOM tags for historical reference in case something does, we need to revert backwards. Uh, but we do uh, do it on the fly in an automated process. There's, um, there's another route that we've taken for smaller migration. So if we're doing like a 30,000 migration, like an ambulatory clinic or um, maybe a small like cardiac heart lab migration of that nature, we will do um, an HL7 MRN conversion to where we do the same process, we get the correct patient information, um, but instead of doing it on the fly and, um, and, and maybe incurring a cost to add that on, we, we do it through an HL7 migration and we basically create HL7 messages and play them in through our interface that automatically does the merging. Um, and so that's just an alternative way that you can kind of target it in a smaller section of patient population or groups. Um, that way you're not having to, you know, do a whole migration. You can isolate it to just a specific subset of patients as well. And then, you know, one other thing just to, I'll leave with a note is you'll never get around of some sort of manual process. There's always the low confidence ratings of patients. There's always the patients that don't exist in your EHR. And there's always the ones with the, with the very common names or the seniors and juniors that you'll always need to kind of break out and then do a manual review on it. So you'll never get away from some sort of level of review. But again, I hope that helps in terms of how we you know, do our automated process and, um, and gives you a little bit more perspective on some other ways to accomplish that as well. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Thanks for walking us through that further detail about the process for MRN conversions at UNC, including those smaller migrations. And thanks, attendee, for that question. This next question is, how does cloud-based PACs fit into this discussion? Brad, Cheryl, Jeff, would one of you like to take the first stab at this question, and then we can open it up to your co-panelists for further comment? I can I can go again yeah. um, from a little technical yeah, perspective, or or Jeff, if you want to um, take this one, but yeah, but, you know, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Brad, Brad, I'll go ahead and take that one. So for cloud-based PACs, we really utilize that at UNC Health from the perspective of sharing images outside of our institution. Um, so for um, our unaffiliated um, hospitals, we, we would go, go ahead and, and 
you'll use tools like LifeImage or PowerShare to be able to um, provide those images and those studies um, across the state and the nation. Um, taking that, that question from a different angle, though, we are, we are um, very much a software as a service provider or a cloud-based solution for many of the hospitals that, that contract with us as part of our network. So we, we provide um, ISD um, shared service offerings like our PACs, like our VNA, um, to these hospitals, and we host them um, in our data center um, along with the business continuity and disaster recovery capabilities. Um, so at, at this point, you know, looking at from the standpoint of um, our organization, um, we, we aren't cloud-based except for doing image exchange outside our network. Um, we fall on-premise model, but you know, for the hospitals that join our organization, we are their SaaS or their cloud provider. Thanks, Cheryl. And Brad and Jeff, anything you would want to add? Cheryl's response? So I think that was Jeff uh, that was just giving that response, but I will. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this Jeff. Is Brad. I I will just say another lens to really think about with cloud-based packs. Uh, you know, think of think of the patient portals that exist in all these EHRs. One of the things we've done at UNC is we've enabled patient access to their images um, through their patient portal, and just think about that a little bit because now every single patient has access to their own images. In the basically in the cloud, they're they're not necessarily stored in the cloud, but you're accessing them from anywhere in the world um, through the internet. So think of that in a little bit too about what does that really mean for a lot of our integration and a lot of our strategies when the patients now have our image enabled, you know, getting their priors. How do we fit that into our workflow stream? Scheduling patients, um, you know, sharing their information with other providers. That is, we are now empowering patients to be able to have their own little mini packs for themselves in their patient portals and start thinking about how that's going to grow and evolve over time and, and how that might be able to work into your workflows and solutions. Um, so it's another kind of lens to look at a cloud-based packs through as well. Perfect. Thank you. I apologize for the mix up there. I was reading through the questions and, and got the names mixed up. But <laughs> Cheryl, this is this, Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl, this question is for you, which is why I had that in mind, but this attendee would like to know about data governance models you would recommend for archiving opportunities, or if you could speak to data governance models, uh, this attendee is curious about that topic. So I thank the attendee for that question. Um, I do believe that enterprise imaging um, at its heart is about data management, and so data governance is critical. And there are universal data governance issues that sometimes come to light as you try to um, consolidate all of your imaging assets, and those are things simply as um, how do you represent the patient's name? Um, I've seen organizations where there is no standard, and so that makes migration very, very difficult. Um, you know, uh, MRNs, how you manage your MRNs. Those things, though, are global and way beyond enterprise imaging. I think when it comes to enterprise imaging, some of the things that we need to start concentrating on is how do we label these images regardless of the modality so that they are easily, easily searched and easily found by any clinician regardless of their specialty. And let's just look at the radiologist. How do we make sure that um, when they are reviewing internal images, all of the comparison studies come up? regardless of whether or not they're generated in radiology or their point of care studies done in the ED or photographs. And then similarly, as you have outside examinations, what, how do you label those studies? So this is an effort that the enterprise imaging community has acknowledged and is really working on trying to start to develop some types of standards for labeling all of these images. And there will be a summit in April, we're calling it the Body Part Summit, to look at all of the existing anatomy um, standards that are out there and pick one 
select one with representatives from vendors, clinicians, um, all users of the system. And then by having that one standard, we can now start to make our, our data work for us with a lot less um, effort. Oops, sorry about that. Um, with a lot less effort. Um, same thing with procedure codes. You know, when you import an outside image, how do you import it? If you just say outside MRI, it's really hard for the person to know is it a knee, is it a brain, is it a foot? And a lot of people don't like using the outside study name because they don't, it doesn't fit with their name. So again, if we had some type of standardization there as an industry, it would be a lot easier to access all of the information that we need about a patient for a specific condition. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you for our attendee who asked that question about data governance models. Brad, this next question I'm going to pose for you. Uh, the attendee said, you mentioned migration. Did you do a self-migration using the VNA, or did you use a third-party migration vendor? <laughs> We've done it all, uh, to be honest with you. Traditionally and recommended, we always use the VNA. There's so many nice tool sets that you get with our VNA that um, is just really helpful, especially with the AccuAdmin portal to be able to deploy that to the, you know, the power users or the, the, the real heroes of a migration that have to work through all the needles in the haystack. You know, every patient has a story in the migration and you get these fancy things called batch door queues where anything that really didn't migrate nicely is, is in this little bucket of stuff and you can deploy that to an end user to work and um, it really allows you to federate and, and, and get the cycles from, um, you know, your, your clinical users to help out with the migration. So it's not just one person looking at a, a pile of a million studies to, to go through. So yes, we always try to use our VNA. However, there are situations uh, we call them media migrations, where you basically have to uh, basically get a third-party vendor involved, to where they go into that external pack system and physically move that media, you know, through other means than DICOM. Um, so we call those media migrations, uh, and, and those are challenging as well, and come with their all problems. And then we've also done things, where, you know, just where we do DICOM toolkits sometimes, um, where you just want to move studies. I don't know if anyone's ever migrated out of a VNA, but that's another thing that we've had to do. And, and we've used um, just, you know, free tools as well as VNA tools to do that. There's no rhyme or reason why you can't use um, one or the other, but traditionally we always go with the VNA because of the additional. Um, tools that are all kind of integrated together. Otherwise, when you're working with either a third-party vendor um, or doing something with your own tool sets, they're not really tightly coupled in a nice, you know, package that works seamlessly together. When you use a VNA uh, like, you know, the Highland or the application suite that it comes with, you really see a streamlined approach that is, is scalable to larger migrations fairly easily when you start talking about a group of people working on a migration comparatively to just one single person, it, it really makes a difference. I hope that helps clear it up a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Brad. So largely using the VNA, but then for those media migrations, having third parties. Yeah. I will say Highland's getting better at, yeah, they're, they're definitely, um, I think, using third party migrators less because they're just getting with the you know expansion into into Highland, I think they're they're in their experience with various migrations. I know we've done Jeff can probably back me up, but we've done quite a bit two hands worth of migrations um, from PAC systems. So we've been definitely given Highland the experience and exercise on how to deal with many different PAC systems. Um, so yeah. you know a lot of it now is being rolled in house with Highland now. Yeah, put some analytics around that. It's been a, a, probably around 12 million studies we've migrated so far yeah. over two years, two to three years. Terrific, thank you. And Jeff, I'm going to stay with you for a moment. This is going to be the last question of our presentation today. Um, 
what was the biggest challenge you experienced in your transition to enterprise imaging, Jeff, and how did you overcome it? Yeah, our biggest challenge that continues today is the overwhelming demand related to enterprise imaging in our organization. And the, the way that we found best address that is you have to have broad base and inclusive um, governance in place, uh, which includes good program and project management. And um, if there's anything I could leave everyone with today is governance is one of the largest success factors in um, you know, an enterprise imaging program. And there's a good class enterprise imaging article that was done a couple of years ago where they did a poll and that was found to be um, one of the most, you know, of, of all the um, respondents, they indicate that as the highest, the most important, um, you know, component of their enterprise imaging program. So governance is key and making sure that it's just not IT focused, um, but it's, um, and you, know, you have a wide net and includes all your stakeholders. Um, Cheryl, I, I don't know if you want to add to that. I know you had some great comments last time we had that question come up in another panel. Um, I think you covered it really well, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Thank you, Jeff. So, you know, attendees, that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank our presenters, Jeff, Brad, and Cheryl, for their excellent presentation, and Highland Healthcare for sponsoring today's webinar. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you.